Hello everyone and welcome to this quick video overview of 42SH, the final project of the Unix branch at Hive Helsinki. This video is going to be a brief overview of some of the features listed on the screen here. It will be more of a guided tour of the project just to showcase what we did rather than a technical breakdown. I won't be getting into any code in this video. 42SH is a big milestone project at Hive. The idea is to create the most stable and complete Unix shell possible. During this project, we worked in a group of two and we used Bash as a reference shell. We also adhered to the POSIX standard wherever relevant and we wrote this project completely in C. So let's jump straight in. I'm just here in a terminal session on Linux. We did write this project primarily on Mac OS, but it is compatible across Linux systems as well. You can see here that I've already compiled the program 42SH and I can jump into our shell simply by running it in the same manner that I, you, you would run any executable file in a Unix terminal. And now we're in 42SH. If you're fairly familiar with the command line, this should be pretty obvious to you. But um, first of all, in a shell, we can type things. And all of the input is handled by term caps. We're using the term caps library to take control of the terminal, put it into our own settings so that we can manage things like the cursor position and uh, the input of text. I can move the cursor back and delete things and rewrite them and everything is uh, moved around in the way that you would expect it to. If I run this command, I can run a command at any time by hitting the enter key. And what's happened here is the shell has searched for a command called hello. It's not been able to found, uh, find one. So it's given, uh, printed an error message and returned the prompt to us and it's now waiting for the next command. I can also exit the shell to come back to bash on Linux here and uh, everything is still running as you would expect it to. We are resetting the settings back to how they were before the program started every time we exit. So if you jump back in again, let's this time give it a command that it actually that actually does exist. Um, so if we run ls here, uh, you can see that in exactly the same way that it does in bash, we fork a new process for ls, run ls in that child process. It prints its output to the standard output and then the shell notices that ls has finished finished executing and returns the prompt to the user and awaits the next command. Um, if I echo out the path variable here, what the shell does every time you give it a command that isn't a built-in function, um, is it will search through the uh, path variable. This is just a list of directories delimited by these colon symbols here. On Linux, ls is found in usr slash bin. So it finds ls in that directory and runs it for us. Echo, incidentally, is a built-in function of the shell. So this isn't a command from the system. For this project, we were required to build multiple different built-ins. So uh, when echo is run, Rather than forking a new process, the shell just takes care of the functionality of echo uh, itself. Um, and there's also some variable expansion here going on with the dollar sign syntax. Um, and yeah, I think that about covers it for that. Let's just get straight into the uh, more nifty things that this shell can do. So um, piping is a unique uh, quality that Unix uh, shells have. So we can run commands together in sequence. So if I just run ls here and then I pipe, and then let's say I wanted to sort the output of ls into reverse lexicographical order, I could use the r flag. And you can see here that ls is writing its output onto this pipe so that sort can then read from it. And then what we're seeing here is the output of sort. So src now, it was at the end, now it's at the start. So what's going on in the background here is that every time we send a text string to the shell by pressing enter, there's some lexical analysis which is happening. We're chunking the text down into uh, blocks, which we refer to as tokens, which can then be categorized. And then with that list of tokens, we can start to construct a data structure called an abstract syntax tree. And then as we uh, execute the command, Based on the context of each command inside that data structure, we know where the pipes need to be set up uh, and read from or written to. And this is completely scalable. I can keep adding things on. Let's say I wanted to um, run it through cat as well. You can see cat E is now appending dollar signs onto the end of each line. 
Um, I could then, let's say I wanted to grab the author file, for example, we now just get author printed and let's say I wanted to count the number of characters in that for some reason I could then use WC uh, with the C flag and now we have eight printed to the standard output so that's six characters for author plus the dollar sign plus the new line character. We can also use redirections with this command so let's say I wanted to redirect the output somewhere other than the terminal window I could just add this operation to the end of our pipeline and then now it, it looks like nothing has happened, but if I then cap the file, we can see that a, our output from that previous command is now being written into our file. You will also notice that if I run uh, ls uh, now, um, we can see that the uh, uh, previously there was no file in this directory called file, uh, but uh, by running this operation here, the shell has noticed that there is no file called file present to write to, so it's created that for the user. Everything is taken care of behind the scenes, and now we can see that the output is going back to the terminal window rather than being continuously written into this file, so it's all taken care of in that one line. We also have file descriptor aggregation, which is quite useful for doing things like silencing error messages. Um, so if I didn't want this error message to be printed, I could do this operation here to close the error output, which is file descriptor 2 by, um, as uh, sort of by default, and now we're not getting that error message. Or I could write the error message onto a pipe if I wanted to. So if I set up a pipe here, I can then cat from that pipe, uh, let's say with the E flag, and you now see that the error message is being printed with a dollar sign at the end of it. Without that operation, the error output would not be written onto the pipe and we wouldn't get that dollar sign there. I think that about covers it for pipes and redirections. Let's have a quick look at job control and then we'll have a look into uh, some of those modular features that we added. So if I run Vim, for example, I, I'm now in Vim and I can write things in Vim. And I can also use the keyboard to send a suspend signal to Vim. So now the shell informs us that Vim has been stopped or suspended and it's now in the background waiting for us to come back to it. I can ls, I can run other commands, I can echo things out. And everything is working as normal. If I refer to the jobs built in, it will tell us that Vim is still there waiting for us and I can use fg or foreground. And now we're back in Vim and hello is still there. Everything is exactly as it was when we suspended it. If I now exit Vim without saving and run jobs again, we can see that that background process is now gone. Uh, let's get straight into some of those modular things now. Um, I've rambled on for far too long on this stuff. So um, I showed you earlier that we can echo out uh, variables. Um, we can also we can also declare our own variables. So if I said, for example, var equals one two three, and then if I echo var, we have one two three printed into the standard output. If I didn't want var to be expanded, I could use single quotes, and we don't expand var or I could backslash escape the dollar sign, and now uh, we get the same result. We also have auto-completion. So um, for example, if I run, um, let's say I wanted to auto-complete to Vim, I could hit the tab key here, and we get, uh, if we hit it a couple of times, we get some suggestions printed into the screen. Um, if I, let's say I wanted to open Vim Tutor, if I type Vim T and press tab, Vim Tutor is also completed for us. If I wanted to um, expand a file path, I can do that with tildes, for example. So a tilde expands to the home directory. If I want to see what's in my workspace directory, I can start typing out WOR, for example, hit tab, that is auto completed. If I now double press tab, oh, sorry, only one press was required, <laughs> um, but uh, it then kind of like ls just shows us what's in that um, directory, what could potentially be expanded to here. So um, there were some other things I wanted to get into here. For example, we do have a hash table as well, um, but uh, maybe I'll do that in another video. This is getting kind of long now. Um, thank you very much. I hope this has given you a little taste of uh, the sort of things that we do at Hive and and um, some of the bigger, more impressive projects that, we're, that we start to do towards the end of our studies. Um, if you enjoyed this video, then uh, do let me know, uh, know if there's anything you'd want a bit more detail on. Maybe you could leave a comment. Um, but yeah, thank you very much for watching. And um, yeah, I think that about covers it.
拜拜。